Thank you so much for being here this morning. It is a pleasure to welcome you. If you have your Bible, I'm going to get you there. We're going to take a bit to get there, but if you would, turn to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter 1 this morning. We have some important business to uh, attend to before we get any further. Most of you know, uh, some of you may not, that Friday we had a chili cook-off, um, extravaganza, whatever word you want to use. And uh, we had three winners in our, in our chili competition, actually four because there was a tie for third place. I'm going to ask those folks <laughs> to come forward at this moment. Come on up here and Ron's got a trophy for you. Come on forward. Um, Larry Brundage, wherever he is, where's Larry? And uh, tied with Larry was who, Ron? I lost my little sticky note. Greg Hazinski, Greg, are you back there? Okay, no Greg, but, but he's, he's still recovering from the chili extravaganza. And uh, Larry Brundage, Greg Hazinski, in third place, you can hold your applause for just a minute. In second place was whom again? Evanita Bickle. Evanita, come on up here. Second place, chili. And Margaret Rogers, first place, chili. Y'all come stand for just a minute. Give them a hand. All right. Two things we want to tell you. Number one, I honor you for your amazing chili making ability. And two, I forgive you for what it did to me both that night into the next day. Thank y'all. Give them a more hand as they have a seat. Yeah, there, there it is. That's the shot. After tasting 17 chilies, some of them wicked hot. That was me walking out of that place after, uh, after the chili deal. So a lot of fun on Friday night. A lot of you hung around till 1030. Uh, and, and we're going to probably do a few more things. We're, we're doing our deal every Sunday night where we play volleyball and open concessions. We're probably going to do a few more things like that once a month. Because, boy, we had folks of all ages come out and stick around and just fellowship together. It was a lot of fun. All right. Uh, guests, so glad that you're here today. Um, if this is your first time with us in particular, or second or third time, we're just thrilled um, that you're here. And we've been in a series entitled, Don't Waste Your Life. We're reading a book uh, as a church of the same title, Don't Waste Your Life. And we've been talking about over these last few weeks how not to waste your life, how to have a life that at the end of your days when you stand before your creator God, you can know that you didn't waste it. Um, rather than read you verses to kick off this morning, there's an illustration that all week long I have just thought about a dozen times. It's just burned itself into my mind all week long to sort of illustrate uh, this point. If you're reading the book, this illustration is taken from a little short piece written by the great scholar and apologist C.S. Lewis. Now, if you don't know C.S. Lewis, um, you may know the movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, based on the book. C.S. Lewis wrote that as a children's book, basically as kind of an allegory about God and Jesus Christ and the point of Christianity. But C.S. Lewis wrote a little piece, absolutely fascinating, called Meditation in a Tool Shed. And here's what he described. He described one day walking into his tool shed, closing the door, and it being absolutely pitch black in the tool shed, except for one beam of light shining down from a crack over the door. And Lewis talked about how in that dark tool shed, the only thing he could see was this beam and it was striking, it was startling. You've seen that before where the dust particles, you can see them going through the beam. He said it was the most impressive thing in that tool shed, the only thing he could see. But he said then he approached the beam and began to look through the beam. And then he could no longer see the darkened tool shed. He could no longer see the beam. Now all he could see were the leaves outside the door and the sun some 90 million odd miles away from that tool shed. And here's what he said, and, and it seems very simple, but in fact it is terribly profound when applied to the spiritual. He said he learned that day that looking at the beam and looking through the beam 
were two very different experiences. Let me tell you what that means to me, and I believe what it meant to that author when he wrote it. We on planet Earth, we in this life, so to speak, are in the darkened tool shed, wondering why we're here, what the point is. There's a lot of darkness and a lot of pain and a lot of trouble around us, but periodically we see these beams of light. We see these blessings, if you will, uh, whether it be family or the love of your mate or, or something lesser, be it money or job or success or sex or food or children or one of 10 billion different beams of light, we see them and they're the most captivating thing in our vision. But what we often don't see, what we often don't do, is get past looking at the beam to looking through the beam, to seeing beyond the blessings, the God who gave the blessings. Beyond the good thing, beyond the money, beyond the children, beyond the love, the God who is the author of every good and perfect gift. And here's the thing, friend. If you spend your life consumed with the beam, if you spend your life consumed with human love and human validation, with sex and food and job and boat and golf clubs and trips and trivialities and television and entertainment. If you spend your life just seeing the beam, you will waste your life. But if you look up through every beam in your life, every good and perfect gift that God gives you, and you don't just see the giver, you don't just see the gift, you see the giver. Listen, he will become the most captivating thing in your life. You'll still get the beams. You'll still get the blessings. Praise God. But you will see beyond them there is someone much greater than anything he can give you. And listen, those who don't waste their life are those who spend their life in every blessing looking up to Jesus Christ who gave it and beckoning for other people to come look to. That's how you don't waste your life. Now, having said that, if our life is about knowing God and making Him known, if our life is about loving Jesus Christ and showing Him lovely to people all around it, and, and that's what so much of the Bible says, if I could just give you a condensation of the book, it's love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Know the glorious God, He's better than anything in the universe, and then make Him known. Bring other people to look through the beams of their life. L listen to a couple of verses that, that I, I believe prove this point and, and, and make it clearly. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When you're standing in the middle of the light and telling other people, you got to come see this. Jesus said you're doing what you were created to do. Listen to this, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Man, ain't that the truth? That you should show forth the praises of him, the glories of him, the beauties of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If you spend your life knowing God and making him known, loving Jesus and showing him lovely, you won't waste your life. Friend, listen, if you're going to do that, if I'm going to do that, we have to realize up front that to lead people to know Jesus to know Jesus yourself intimately. And there's a lot of Christians who get all caught up in the beams and waste their life even though they know Christ. If you're going to do what he made you to do, you're going to have to get past and help other people past some obstacles. If I had a title for my message today, it would very simply be Obstacles 
And I want to show you one of the greatest obstacles that we are called in knowing and showing Jesus to get people past and to get past ourselves. Go to Romans chapter 1. If you're glad to be here today, say amen. Romans chapter 1. I was proud of the class I taught this morning, our friendship class. The air was out over there. I think we had air out in a couple of buildings, just one of those fluke things that happens on occasion, but they just gutted it out and, and listened through that. So it is so much cooler in here right now, for which I thank God. Um, I still intend to fully, fully sweat in the worst of ways before this sermon is over, so I will just prepare you now. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 is narrating the human condition in a way that no studier of human behavior ever could. And it's an unflattering picture. Let me prepare you for that. Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, inspired by God, writes these words. For the wrath of God, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, literally hold down, suppress, ignore, look past the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed against people who don't want to see Jesus, they just want to see the beam. They want to ignore the fact that he gave the gift so they can focus on the gift. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. God shows very plainly. If there's a creation, there must be a creator. If I have a sense of right and wrong, there must be an originator of right and wrong. It is very clear that if there's a sunbeam, there must be a sun. But there, human beings in our natural state suppress that, hold that down, ignore that. Now watch this. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, quite literally empty in their thinking, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God, or literally exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They worship the work of their hands instead of worshiping God. They worship the beam instead of worshiping the sun, S-O-N, verse 24. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. One more. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. Literally, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Worshiped and served the gift more than the giver. Worshiped the created, not the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Here's what I want you to see. And lest we put this off on like somebody else, like the serial killers and the abusers of their family and all that, God is not describing the worst of men, he's describing all men. He's describing all women. He's describing all of us in our natural state have suppressed the tr truth of God, have ignored the creator so we could worship the creation. And here's the point, very plainly, man, all men, dethrones divine revelation. There's a God, you're accountable to him. He dethrones divine revelation and enthrones human reasoning. My own understanding of the universe, my own understanding of life, how I feel, what I believe, 
is God, not God's revelation of himself. And friend, this leads me to the point of this message, which is this. If you're going to spend your life and not waste your life, if you're going to invest your life in knowing and loving God and making God known and loved, one of the biggest objections you're going to have to get people past, the biggest variety of objections, are intellectual objections. I don't see it like that. I don't believe God is like that. Let me give you some of the most famous How could a good God, you say he's so good, you say he's love, how could he allow so much suffering in the world? Stands and watches with omnipotent power while little children starve to death and are abused in the worst of ways? How could a good God allow so much suffering? How could there be just one true religion? You honestly believe that somehow you out of all the thousands of years of human history and the many, many, many different religions, you cornered the market and you and your friends are the smartest, wisest in the world and somehow got it right when everybody else got it wrong and they don't know anything and and how, how narrow of you, how could there be just one true religion? And listen, if you talk to people you know about Christianity or, or the faith, you know the stuff I'm talking about is absolutely true. And by the way, many of us, let's not demonize anybody, have these same questions that I'm talking about. In fact, all of us have had one or two or more or whatever, so let's just listen for a minute. If God is so good, why has the church been responsible for so much injustice? And by the way, many don't see divisions in churches or different brands. They just say, You know, what's happening over here? What about the abuse of children that's going on in the church? What about all the scandals and affairs and the the cliche deal of pastors and secretaries and and all of that, and, and the crusades and all of that? So much injustice propagated by Christians. Why is that if God is real and Christianity is true? Here's a big one. How can a loving God send people to hell? You say, God loves me, God loves the world, and we'd call a man a fiend if he wanted to put somebody in a dark room and torture them in the worst of ways their entire life, keep them alive to torture them, and you're telling me this loving God puts people in a fiery hell, not for a lifetime, but for infinity, and he's love? Not only questions, statements. Science has disproved Christianity, some would say. You you can't think rationally. You can't think empirically and believe in all these invisible things. You can't take the Bible literally, some would say. Listen, it might have been right way back in the day, but we're talking copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. we, We got like the adulterated, watered down version. You can't take it literally. How about this one? Don't you know churches are filled with hypocrites? At least I'm real. Man, I go out and do my thing, but I'm not lying to anybody about it. I I do what I do, and I'm not trying to convince anybody. And church is a place where all these people come and put on their masks and, and pretend to be whatever on Sunday, but you know what they are on Monday. Human reasoning. Here's where I'm going with this, friend, and it is it is going to kick off the next series of sermons because starting next week the sermons are going to be how could a a good God allow so much suffering sermons are going to be how could there be just one true religion the sermons are going to be how can a loving God send people to hell that's going to be like the titles of these next number of weeks but before we get there let me say this If you're going to know God and make him known, if you're going to not waste your life, you're going to have to help people past their intellectual obstacles. Quite frankly, that means you're going to have to know what you believe. You may be here today and you say, preacher, I know what I believe. 
I believe Christianity is the true faith. I believe Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior. I believe that the Bible is inspired, inerrant God's holy word. I believe that it is a light to our path. I believe that what it says goes, where it says don't do this, we shouldn't do it, and where it says take this path, we ought to. I believe in traditional orthodox Christianity. I know what I believe. Friend, that may very well be true. Let me ask you this, do you know why you believe it? All right, now let's all buckle up. Everybody still with me? Say amen. Do you know why you believe what you believe? I fear that a lot of us, and and by the way, this is not a bad place to begin, have quite plainly an inherited set of beliefs. That is not a bad place to begin. I pray that my little children, Aubrey, who's seven, Vance, who is four, I pray that they are going to inherit my belief system. People say, well, you ought to let your children completely decide on their own. Really? Do you let them decide what they're going to eat and whether they're going to wear clothes to school and whether they're going to get shots? And wh- I mean, we're here as parents to guide them into the best paths. I hope that there's an inherited set of beliefs that daddy has taught them and mama has taught them and we've lived sufficiently to show them that even though we're pretty messed up and imperfect, we truly love this Savior who we preach. That's what I hope. An inherited set of beliefs is a great place to start but it is not a great place to stay. Why do you believe this? Because my preacher taught me that. Why do you believe it? Because my church believes it. Why do you believe it? Because my daddy believes it. But if you get down into why is Christianity preferable to all these others, why do you think this Bible is truly inspired of God when there's so much quote-unquote holy literature out there? How, why can you tell me that your God's loving when my eyes and ears and mind tell me that he does this and this and this or at least allows this in the universe? And a lot of us quite simply are left dumbfounded. I want to spend the rest of this sermon hopefully in the in the most persuasive God help me of ways pointing out why it is awfully important if you are going to spend your life knowing God and making God known and not waste your life you've got to know what you believe and why you believe it great message of this church that we will never forget your hand has got to cleave to this sword It has got to become a part of you and a part of your life and a part of your beliefs. You've got to wrestle with it. You've got to fight with it. And you say, I'm not a theologian and I hadn't been to Bible college. We're going to get to that at the end. Let me give you three reasons why you need to know why you believe what you believe. Three reasons and it's just three words. The first word is this. Scrutiny. Scrutiny. You need to know why you believe what you believe. Is Christ the Son of God? Yes, I believe he is. Why do you believe that? Is the Bible the inspired, infallible, and errant word of God? Yes, it is. Why do you believe that? Do you believe in a heaven and a hell and an afterlife? Yes, I believe it. Why do you believe it? One of the reasons why you need to know why you believe what you believe is because of scrutiny. Tim Keller um, wrote a book called The Reason for God that I'm reading right now, which has already in the first chapter kind of put me in awe. Here's what he wrote. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do. I don't think y'all heard that. I'm going to read that one again. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do, will find themselves defenseless against the probing questions of a smart skeptic. Only if you struggle long and hard with objections to your faith will you be able to provide grounds for your belief to skeptics that are plausible rather than ridiculous or offensive. Man, y'all, I cannot tell you how many times 
I have witnessed, witnessed, and probably even been the Christian who in talking to someone with some honest reasonings, you say their reasoning is flawed. Our reasoning is all flawed from birth. That's what we read in Romans 1. But somebody with some honest questions about the faith, a Christian responds with either silence or an argument that is ridiculous or just flat out offensive. By the way, what I understand, I don't have solid data to back this up, but people who I respect gave the data and I heard them say it, let me put it out that way, that out of all the denominations from whom groups like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses draw their followers, Baptists are high on the list. Because here's what will happen. If you don't know why you believe what you believe, I tell you what, a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness will take you down, my friend. You don't dare get in a conversation with them. You say, do you believe there's truth in that? I'm not trying to be offensive or ugly. I believe that that teaching is an absolute error. It teaches that Christ is not God. It teaches a whole different thing. Are, are there fine moral people who are a part of that? Yes, there are, as, as moral as any of us are. In fact, a lot more moral than a lot of Baptists I know, but I believe it is false to its core. But I tell you what, their people know the reasons why they believe what they believe. And if you don't, conversation with a co-worker, conversation with a friend, conversation with a neighbor, conversation with the guy across the locker from you, listen, a smart skeptic will take you down, and that doesn't bring glory to God. That doesn't show God to be the amazing, beautiful, powerful Savior He is. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You do have to know why you believe what you believe. Now, if you're still with me, say amen. Here's the second word. You need to know why you believe what you believe for scrutiny. Oh, man, a lot. You need to know why you believe what you believe for tragedy. Let me quote, quote one more time um, Dr. Keller here. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if he or she has failed over the years to listen patiently to their own doubts which should only be discarded after long reflection. Now hang on a minute. Say, what well, doubts? Doubts are bad. Doubts are evil. You, you push doubts down. You get doubts away. Th those are opposite to faith. You trust God. You, you don't look at doubt. You shun it and push it down and get it away from you. Let me tell you a couple things on that. I wonder how many Christians, I wonder how many who believe themselves to be Christians have a whole set of inherited beliefs that they don't know why they truly believe. They've never wrestled with them. They've never questioned them. The doubts that inevitably come up to everybody, everybody in here's wondered at some point about God and hell. Everybody in here's wondered about what if that other religion might be right? What if we're wrong? What if they're right? Most all of us, all of us I would say, have had those doubts and the person who brushes them away when tragedy comes, When you lose a child, when your best friend gets sick and lays in a hospital bed in agony for years, when God doesn't take away one mate, he takes two or three, when the winds blow fiercely. lightning strikes if your house isn't built on something deep the house of your faith will blow down my friend and everybody in here who's lived very long at all knows that you've seen it somebody who used to come to church with you used to 
trust God and walk with God, that when things got awful and torturous and agonizing, they didn't have enough to keep them steady and keep them there. They had never dealt properly with their doubts. Do you notice what he said in that quote? A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if, he, if, if she has failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. Listen, doubt is like a flu shot if you use it right. You know, when you get that flu shot, and I'm going to speak very unmedically, okay, because I'm not a medical guy. So if you come up and tell me, well, the ABC of the DEF, okay. I'm with you. My understanding is they give you a little bit of flu, a little bit of flu now, so your immunity is built up when the real thing comes later. Listen, your doubts, your struggles, why would God do this? Why would God allow this? Why would God seem to indicate this? Why would the universe run like this? Why would it look one way when God says it's another? If you push that stuff aside and don't deal with it, your immunity won't be built up when the real pain comes. You need to take those doubts and let them push you to investigate your faith. I promise you, I'll make you a promise from this pulpit. You truly, honestly, genuinely, without apathy, without pride, without self-deception, seek the living God, seek his truth, seek to understand. You will not understand everything, but you will find God to be lovelier than when you started the journey. Bring your questions to him. Bring your troubles to him. Bring your pain to him. And listen, if something's true, it shows itself more true when you shine the light of inspection on it. Dead stuff decays when you put sun on it. Living things grow and flourish. For the inevitable tragedies in your life that will come, you need to know why you believe what you believe right now. Let me give you one more thought, and I'm going to be done. You need it for scrutiny. You need to know why you believe what you believe for tragedy. Third of all, you need to know why you believe what you believe for empathy. I meet a lot of Christians. And I'm afraid I was one at one point, and God is beginning to change this in me as slow as that process might be. There are a lot of Christians who have very little sympathy, empathy, understanding, heart for people outside the faith. Their attitude is sort of, I believed it, why won't you? I'm better, you're pagan. I'm God's, you're not. When I meet somebody who truly, genuinely feels that sense of superiority, you mark this down, you're looking at somebody who has never really wrestled with their faith. When you do, when you do, you will come to realize that some of those questions are hard questions without easy answers. You will begin to understand in more vivid ways than you can imagine that God's grace is so amazing that the miracle is not that he doesn't save everyone, it's that he saves anyone. You need to wrestle with it. You need to fight for it. You need to let those questions boil up and lead you to do what the psalmists did, what the prophets did. How many times did David say, God, I don't understand this and this is awful and when are you going to rescue me? You haven't shown up yet. How many times with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Moses, God is not looking for your brave face, he's looking for honesty. He's looking for you to get real and not be satisfied till you get some answers. Am I saying he's going to answer every question you ever? 
friend, if you make this journey, you won't need every question answered because the God who will meet you there will give you something you don't have right now, and that is peace. I want to close with this. Preacher, I, that's fine for you. You're a pastor, you've been to Bible college, you, you do this every week, you have all week long to study your Bible and study apologetics, apologetics basically being these reasonable reasons of the faith. You get all week to do that. And, and I know other people that, that they're out, you know, in, in the world going to war every day, having to be in business and support a family and wonder how they're going to pay the bills. I know people that are so genius, they can do all that and study the Bible like a scholar too. But preacher, that ain't me. I read and sometimes I don't get anything. I wouldn't know exactly where to begin with all that, and if you told me, I'm not sure I could really get it. I'd, I'm nervous talking to anybody. I'd certainly be terrified trying to explain my faith to a detractor. Let me tell you why, if you're honest with God and honest with yourself, you're the very kind of person he's going to use. Turn to this scripture, 2 Corinthians 10. Just two books over, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 3. Chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are not fleshly, they are not physical, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, that word means arguments, and every high thing, every lofty opinion that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see what Paul said, listen, no matter what you think you are, no matter what you think you aren't, the weapons we're using are not simply physical weapons. They're not just human intellect. There's not just speaking ability. God's got some spiritual weapons for you. He's got the word of God that, that men with second grade educations preached with fire in the past because the Holy Spirit of God will help you to use these spiritual weapons to know your Bible, to get your hands and your heart around it, to cast down every imagination, to cast down every lofty opinion that stands against the living God. Next Sunday morning, probably, how could there be just one true religion? And we're going to take it from there. I'm going to ask you, come join us on this journey. If you've got questions that need answers, the guy you're looking at doesn't have all the answers, but I know one who does. If you're here and you know Jesus Christ, but the truth is, you can't defend your faith very well and you'd have a hard time showing Christ to be who he is because you don't know why you believe what you believe. I'm going to ask you to take this journey with me. Let's wrap our hearts and minds and hands around the scripture and let God do something great. Those of you who are just simply geniuses and know an awful lot, come condescend to hang out with us for a few weeks. And I believe God is going to give you something special too. Let's all stand. I'm going to pray and uh, Trey and the musicians are coming. And this is a moment where we ask God to invade our lives with his truth. To cast down any fake, phony anything we've hidden behind which is untrue and false, any imagination, thought, excuse. 
I can't believe God because of this. I can't trust Christ because of this. Friend, you willing to search that thing out or is that just your excuse? We're going to pray. We open up these altars. There's nothing magical about these. But sometimes you need to move. Sometimes you need to step out and physically do something. You can come pray at these altars. We're going to have counselors up here that if you need to pray with somebody, you need to set up some counseling in these days to come. We're doing a lot of that with young couples and other folks, just talking them through difficulties and problems and marriage and finances, all that. We can do that today. And a lot of you, right there in your seat, need to talk to God about getting a tighter grip on who He really is and what He really says and what you really believe. I'm going to pray and then we're just going to get real quiet for a time. I'm going to ask you if you can help it, not to move around a whole lot, not to leave unless you have to, just so everyone's undisturbed as we talk to the one who's closer than the air we breathe in this place right now. Father, you're here, you are mighty, you are amazing, you are beyond our comprehension. I pray you will speak intimately to one that is here today about their need for Christ. I pray you'll speak intimately to one that's already yours about the fact they may have gotten apathetic, they may have laid off, and they're chasing beams instead of chasing the sun. God, I pray for all of us, and this preacher in particular, that we'll love you more and show you in better, clearer ways. We give this time to you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.